On today's show, we asked yesterday, were the Bucks going to bring in any new faces? And I guess one of the new faces is new. The other one, not so much, but Malik Beasley and Robin Lopez reportedly set to join the Milwaukee Bucks as free agent acquisitions. We'll break down what it means for Beasley. Uh, Lopez, what is, where does he fit in the mix? We'll look at the depth chart and ask whether maybe these moves are still starting to pre, uh, be a precursor for what could come potentially via trade. Let's talk about it. You are Locked On Bucks, your daily Milwaukee Bucks podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You are Locked On Bucks. My name's Kane Pittman. You can see and hear me on this show Monday to Friday and also find my work over at ESPN. And alongside me from the Bucks Radio Network is Justin Garcia. And we are pumped up today because uh, we were going to talk about Summer League and we're still going to get to that eventually. But we got two names come in, which is Podcasting Gold. And shout out to the Milwaukee Bucks. They made the fans wait a little bit, but they were just saving it for the Monday to Friday uh, Locked On Bucks episode. So we absolutely appreciate that. Uh, today's show is brought to you by Price Picks. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with the promo code locked on. That's pricepicks.com, promo code locked on. As always, we thank you for making Locked On Bucks your first watch or listen uh, every single weekday, right through the off season as well. Once we get through free agency, Summer League next week, and then we're leading into the World Cup, and there'll be a few familiar faces there as well. So it's going to be non stop in the lead up to next season. So if you haven't subscribed or dropped a like or left us a hopefully positive review, uh, make sure you do that and drop your comments on your thoughts on today's show, yesterday's show, whatever it may be, uh, but we appreciate the support. So uh, I'm back in Australia, Justin, and uh, so now this means that these reports were coming in early. I was struggling to sleep a little bit anyway because I only got back in the country yesterday, uh, and the Robin Lopez news came through first. I said, okay, that's kind of interesting, at least if you look at the makeup of the roster. But the Malik Beasley one, let's start here. Because we were looking at this roster, we were understanding the Bucks probably needed to add a guard or certainly needed to look at the guard position. Uh, Beasley fits not only positionally, he's a shooter, he's 6'4". Uh, also, the age might excite Bucks fans. 26, he'll turn 27 in November. So let's work through Malik Beasley first before we get to anything else. Uh, I think at this point in free agency, it's a minimum deal. It's kind of the, the value potential, I guess, higher upside player that the Bucks probably need to get. Yeah, you mentioned the age. And um, it's funny, too, because he was one of the, what, maybe like five or so guys that was seemingly on – uh, like every Bucks fans list for ideal off season, Malik Beasley, not only uh, coveting him, but for the veterans minimum, which you're able to get him at. And, and you look at some of the other deals that were given out. Uh, it's been an interesting off season when, when you see obviously the tax that some teams have had to pay to, to lure guys to their situation. And then we've seen a number of deals as well that are, or head scratchers on the other end of man, how did how did this team get that guy for the minimum? Eric Gordon going for the minimum, uh, even the Austin Reeves deal in that you know nobody basically called the Lakers bluff and threw a lot of money at him and, and tried to put them in a, in a negative spot. But uh, the Bucks were able to benefit here as well. So on the one hand, as as we've already addressed the Brook Lopez stuff, on the one hand you had that of was it an overpay? I mean. Maybe, but the, the whole, well, you overpaid for it. It's it's a different conversation, but I just don't know what an overpay is. But to get Malik Beasley um, for the minimum, I think is a great deal. I'm not going to take too much from it and and think, oh, well, Malik Beasley, I know people have pointed out, well, a 20 points a game guy three years ago, sure. Um, but I think what does stand out is the minutes played regular season are very comparable to the Grayson Allen minutes in, in the special of the last few years. And last year, especially mm. uh, with the Lakers, Malik Beasley actually played fewer minutes than Grayson Allen and still got up nearly twice as many threes in that amount of time. So like, those are the things you do like to see of, okay, well, this is a guy that is certainly not going to be bashful. He's younger, as you pointed to the age. Um, I think if you were going to point to the, well, it's a nice depth piece, but it would be on the defensive end. And then also, you know, the last two rounds of the playoffs, he was basically out of the rotation for the Lakers. 
So there's a couple of ways to look at this, and you've already highlighted the defensive stuff. So uh, let's be honest. If you're picking up guys at this point on the minimum deals, you're not getting the perfect the guy. Other, right? Yeah, they're, they're a good defender or they're a good scorer. And I think we've asked the question certainly in the past, if there was one thing the Bucks were lacking, and this isn't to say at, at some point, does he end up starting some games? Probably, I would say. Again, it's probably going to depend what the Bucks do, and we'll get to that a little bit later in the show. Is there another trade coming? Uh, but if you're looking at a guy that is coming off the bench as a scorer, we've asked the question, do the Bucks need someone that is kind of just going to come out and fire away and get shots up? That's what Malik Beasley does. He's not necessarily going to be a great defender again, as you pointed to. The big question for me is where is the upside in his offensive game? So you mentioned the Minnesota stuff. The team wasn't great. He could definitely score. He definitely wasn't shy about it. But in those Minnesota uh, teams where he was putting up legitimately 20 points a night he was also up over 40 percent from three and those sort of games were split over two seasons so one year i think he was 42 percent. the next year is 39 but a high percentage on over eight three-point attempts per game so this guy can really score and i I think the bucks have needed that the question will be offensively uh, is he going to be a guy that just stands around and is used as a as a catch and shoot guy because that's pretty much what he did for the Lakers last year. Sixty eight percent of his shots came from three. A very high percentage of those were of the catch and shoot variety. But in Minnesota, it wasn't quite the case. In those stretch in Minnesota, fifty percent of his shots came from three. Twenty five percent at the rim. Twenty five percent from mid range. So the question for me is, with his offensive game, because it's not that the Bucks have necessarily needed guys that can knock down shots. They've had those guys. But is Malik Beasley someone that can add a little bit more versatility offensively and score in different ways and create problems in whatever minutes he plays? If it's 15 to 20 minutes, you're going to want him to be scoring. Uh, can he create problems for the defense? Yeah, I was going to say the the Lakers year was kind of the outlier year, at least in recent years, that yeah. you know, when you thought of Malik Beasley, he's a movement shooter that he can mm-hmm. you know get off those awkward type of shots. And I think that's the biggest difference that he brings. Obviously, he is not going to be shy in uh, getting up shots. We've seen Grayson Allen's offensive game develop um, to the point where I, I think I've been a bigger Grayson Allen defender than most. But I, I think some of the things that he worked on and improved at scoring near the basket or at least uh, the dribble drive and, and and what he's been able to do there has certainly uh, been a nice addition to his game. But Malik Beasley is just a different type of score and especially a different type of shooter where you mentioned the catch and shoot stuff. It's nice to have those guys when you're playing with Giannis. And I think Grayson, certainly that first year, especially really benefited from that. I think the first, what, two months of, of that season, two years ago, we were looking at the numbers of man, look at the three point attempts and the amount of open looks and the catch and shoot that Grayson Allen is getting was really jumping off the page more than any guy we had seen with Giannis. But you know, at, we'll keep coming back to the playoffs and how this offense is, is kind of grinded down to a halt, not just last year, but the really last five years. I'm not saying Malik Beasley is the cure all, but the way he plays, like that's what the bucks need. When you're talking about the hop, the half court struggles in the offense and guys that can just get off shots really from anywhere. And it's not dependent on who's on the floor with you Or are you getting these open looks? That's not Malik Beasley. He can get his own shots. And that's something, again, not to say he's an all-star, but it's something that the Bucs really haven't had a lot of. Yeah, so the question, and I think it's a good point you make, and this is, again, why it comes back to the offensive stuff that he can do uh, that may be different from guys Bucs have had in the past because I've got no doubt that Malik Beasley can be a really good regular season player for this team. But the question is, offensively, can that convey uh, convert through to the postseason as well? Because think about Miami and some of the guys that have made money there with, uh, well, Caleb Martin is going to be in Miami, but well, maybe, maybe not. They might be making some, some moves there. But Gabe Vincent, another one, who obviously goes to the Lakers now, those guys were able to do some stuff offensively in the postseason. Max perhaps, Struis. Max Struis, perhaps they were asked to do a little bit more then uh, perhaps that uh, overall they, they should be. But if Malik Beasley is a, your fifth or sixth guy but can have moments in postseason games where he can he can score in a variety of ways, then that's something the Bucks really just haven't had. Yeah, that's the big part I was going to mention or, or say is, you know, it, it's not even in, – in, as we said at the top, when, when you get to this point in free agency and, and for a guy that's 
ideally you just mentioned the pecking order on the roster that's where he's going to slide in so it's it's one or the other at this point you're not going to find really a very good two-way player here you're either going to find a guy that can give you something offensively or give you something defensively and it's how he fits with the rest of your pieces but when you look at at least as presently constructed the, the bucks backcourt or their wing players um I think the big difference here, and again, not to overblow this, but where you would be a little more optimistic is if I rattle off the names of Grayson Allen, Pat Connaughton, and even Javon Carter, who's since departed, but all these guys we've seen shuttle through here and now add Malik Beasley to the mix, Brent Forbes too, for that matter. Who is the guy in that group of names most likely doesn't have to be a playoff run, but in a playoff series, if I told you one guy on this list is capable of going off and having that game where it's 25 or 30 points, I think it's clearly Malik Beasley. And again, you don't need that every single game in the series. If he can do that once or twice, that's what you're looking for because that's what's evaded this team the last couple of years. All right. I'm kind of with you. Some tempered optimism here about... Uh, what this could mean and, and is it something different for the Bucks? let us know what you think in the YouTube comments about the uh, reported signing of Malik Beasley uh, of course these deals uh, can all become official here in in the next couple of days or a couple of days away from now uh, I got a question for you Justin coming up next there was something you mentioned at the live pod we've referenced it a couple of times over the last few days on the show uh, and then we're going to talk about Robin Lopez and then look at the overall depth chart of the Bucks and see what potential moves they may still have in the bank here. And now, most likely coming by trade. So we'll talk about that. Plenty more to come. But first, Price Picks. Uh, if you aren't aware of how Price Picks works, and they've been long-time sponsors of the show, I said it yesterday. If you're not aware how Price Picks works, you're just not listening to Locked On Bucks enough. But you pick two to six players, and if they score more or less than their Price Picks projection, you can win up to 25 times your money on any entry. Uh, you don't have to compete against other people. It's just you versus the projections available. Right now, I would be looking at MLB, uh, WNBA. Uh, there's plenty of soccer going on around the world. You can even do esports, NASCAR, tennis, uh, golf as well. So go check out uh, cricket for people that live in uh, my part of the world. There, The ashes going on right now. So check out Price Picks. Uh, entries can be made in 60 seconds or less. It's that easy. It's safe and fast to use. So download the Price Picks app. Or go to pricepicks.com to sign up and play daily fantasy sports. First time users can receive 100% instant deposit match up to 100 bucks with the promo code locked on. Don't forget to enter the promo code locked on at sign up for an instant deposit match up to 100 bucks. And that's Price Picks. Uh, coming up later this week on the show, uh, we'll continue to monitor free agency, not just from the Bucks situation, but everything else going on around the league. Uh, we'll be talking trades. Don't you worry about that because that's what everyone is discussing right now from Damian Lillard to what's happening at the Bucks, And then Summer League uh, from next week, we'll have post-game shows back again. And at some point this week, we're going to preview Summer League because it's a pretty cool roster that the Bucks have actually. And I think uh, there's plenty for, plenty for Bucks fans to watch. So keep it locked into Locked on Bucks, uh, as you should be doing Monday to Friday either way. Uh, so the one other thing I'll just mention with uh, Malik Beasley. So, only 26 right now, uh, as I said, 27 in November. But he's in an interesting position where he's already signed a big contract in his career, the four-year, $60 million deal originally uh, that he signed uh, in Minnesota there. So now for him to come back to a minimum situation, I've seen a, a few people discuss this, but to me at least, that's why getting a younger guy on the minimum deal gets you a little bit more excited because... I would have to imagine Malik Beasley has plenty of years left in his career and he's not viewing himself as a minimum player, but he might view this as the perfect situation to make him some money down the road and then sign another longer term, big money deal. So it's not a veteran that's just chasing a ring at the end of his career. This should be a young, highly, highly motivated player to ensure that this situation works out and he earns himself some big cash down the road. Highly, uh, highly motivated. And, you know, he's, again, he's hit some big shots in his career and that's what you're looking for. And he's, he's been in some of those spots. I know not, not deep until last year with those, the playoff run with the Lakers. And as I mentioned, he was essentially out of it, those final two rounds out of the rotation, but still he's been in those moments 
in the regular season, he's hit a number of big shots and had big performances. But the key thing that you touched on at the start was uh, the age. And, you know, we've spent so much time in the last year and and getting ready for free agency talking about this team and how, you know, even if you run it back per se, great, but at some point they got to get younger. This is a start. And if you can develop the guys that you brought in on draft night as well, that's another start. If Marjan Beauchamp can develop even further, that's another piece of the start. So one by one, if you can start to add some guys under the age of 30, that's the direction you're going to look to head here in these next two years. So the question I had, actually, I'll save this for later because we'll get to the depth chart a, a little bit later in the show. Let's get to Robin Lopez now. So and this is a fun little reunion for a number of reasons. And uh, obviously, we spoke about the Brook Lopez deal and the money that he is reportedly set to sign for in Milwaukee, but Lopez did spend the one season in Milwaukee. And, and I don't really honestly know, you know, what Robin Lopez has got in the tank. I don't really know what the role would be expected in this team, but clearly you're bringing in a guy that everyone knows, everyone loves. It's a, it's a nice locker room fit. He only averaged eight minutes per game in around 35 games last year for Cleveland, which is the lowest in his 15 years in the NBA. So, you know, I guess the big question is, we asked this a little bit last year when there was maybe some concern about Brook Lopez and Giannis, obviously, he's just going to miss some games now. That's that's the way things operate. So we did ask, do the Bucks need a backup center? But they've got a lot of guys now in the four to five range. But uh, what did you make of Robin Lopez uh, perhaps joining this team again and this uh, specific roster now? Um First of all, it was a good, shrewd move by John Horst to get Brooke Lopez signed first and then uh, just hit him with the news of, by the way, your arch nemesis has now joined the team as well. So Can that he still was a, back out? Yes. It yeah. was a smart move by John Horst. Uh, I was uh, very surprised by yeah. it when you saw it come through. At, at first, you see the name Lopez and you thought it was another Twitter glitch where it's just like, why am I getting the tweets from three days ago now? Um I mean, I guess there's a number of ways to look at it. This could be um, not necessarily like Rook insurance because we're, we've seen how he reacted uh, post-surgery last year, but it just gives you another, well, you'd still like to have some size. And, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe one of these years you're going to have to face Joel Embiid in the playoffs, even though that's what's been evading you year by year. Um, so it would be nice on that end. Uh, but as you mentioned, the, the, all of a sudden, there's a lot of depth in the front court now. And, and it seemed like last year that was the opposite. And, it, and we spent so much time of, man, if if Brooke or Giannis goes down for a little bit of time, you're pretty thin. And now you've added some more size. I mean, Jay Crowder coming back as well. I think prior to acquiring him, we had these high hopes of you know, Jay is going to be your wing guy and he can defend threes and potentially even twos. And maybe he gets back to it, but it, it certainly seemed like from what we saw last year, Jay's really a four. So you now all of a sudden have a number of guys that are playing at the four. And now you have the Lopez brothers at uh, the center position. I'm not saying that this reeks of a trade, but it does seem like the Bucks are not quite done yet. Yeah. And look, we've mentioned this a few times, but they've been all over reports over the last a few weeks here that they're at least kicking the tires on guys or making calls or asking the question. So I, I don't certainly at this point, I, I think there's been enough smoke with some of the guys they've been interested in that the bucks are at least just keeping their, their options open in terms of the roster. But as it stands right now, they have uh, 14 guys and we can get uh, into that in just a little bit. Cause I've got some questions for you about the depth chart and the questions for the listeners as well. I just want to read out this one silly stat that I just tweeted because it just like cracked me up about Robin Lopez. So, as I said, he was with the Bucks for one season. In 66 games with the Bucks, he attempted 105 three-point shots. <laughs> Which, as we know, if we want to see some cup of tea uh, celebrations this year with the Bucks, everyone will be happy with that. And multiple people have been tweeting about the wrestling pregame as well. That might be back this season. So 105 three-point attempts in 66 games. For the rest of his career, 79 three-point attempts in 910 games. So, uh, yeah, Mike Budenholzer, we saw a little bit of it from John Henson in the short period, 2018-19, but 
certainly as long as when Bud was here, if you're a big man and you hadn't shot threes in the past, you were going to be doing so uh, in the Bucks offense. And we saw Robin Lopez actually be kind of a, kind of a decent corner three-point shooter there. So I'm not sure if that'll be the case this year. We'll see how much he plays, but it might come down to the depth chart, which is what we're going to discuss next. If I look at the names I've got down here on my uh, little notepad, so I'll just rip through the names that I've got. Uh, Drew Holiday, Pat Connaughton, Grayson Allen, Malik Beasley, Bochamp, Middleton, Crowder, Giannis, Portis, Brooke, and Robin Lopez, uh, and Thanasis again, which which I guess is is the one question mark here. But, you know, if we assume that Thanasis is going to be there, and then the two rookies in Livingston and, and Jackson Jr. So that takes you to 14 guys. Uh, as I, we've mentioned a couple of times, for a number of reasons, flexibility with the roster, maybe there is a trade and yeah, who knows it, it, what the trade would look like. But the Bucs, in, certainly in the last couple of years, have entered the season with the 14 guys. So they're already at 14. So from a free agency standpoint, this probably looks like it's going to be it. But I'm still looking at the guard position on this team. We've discussed Grayson and Beasley a little bit. There's certainly some crossover there in terms of the skill set, which is fine, but that's do do you need both? I'm not I'm not hundred percent sure. Then you got Drew Holiday, Pat Connaughton, and Marjon Beauchamp, really to me, as the guys that play the guard position. Now I didn't mention AJ Green, but yeah, we'll see what happens there with him. So I'm still sitting here and kind of saying, I wouldn't mind one more guard on this roster. It feels like they're a little light. Um yeah, I, I don't uh, I don't disagree, and I think the obvious is uh, somebody that can handle the basketball too is is when you say you'd you'd, uh, you'd want another guard. Um, the problem is one by one. It wasn't a great free agent class if that's what you're looking for. You know, to begin with, I think ideally you would have loved to have kept Javon Carter, but for that money, great, great, good for Javon to to get that. And to be able to return home and play for the Bulls as well, um, but the Bucks were also kind of in that spot where you know we're waiting on Brook, and uh, it seemed like the Chris thing it was worked out not to uh, to get any tampering charges, but well in advance here you were just kind of waiting on the Brook situation to resolve itself, and in the process um, again there wasn't a whole lot to choose from, but those guys all found homes and, and moved on. So really. Uh, the the guard and, and primarily the backup point guard, or depending on how you view Drew Holiday, the point guard of this team, it seems like it, it needs to be addressed. And the only way you can do it is is via trade. Because, again, not a whole lot of uh, great names that are out there. Corey Joseph just signed. Uh, Dennis Smith Jr., who actually had a pretty good year last year, went for the minimum as well. So it, it seems as though it's going to have to come through the trade route. I think everybody has uh, seen all of the same rumors and names that this team is may or may not be tied to. Maybe it's just fan speculation. Um, but I will say as well, I know the wizards have a trio of point guards that bucks fans, or at least two of them now have been interested in. I think the difficulty there is, it really seems like if you did a trade with the Wizards, it would have to be a three-team deal because I don't know what the Bucks have. That would be what the Wizards are looking for and where they're headed. And then you get to some of the bigger names, which brings a bigger contract, which makes it even more interesting with the roster situation you just described, that it certainly seems like it would have to be a, a two-for-one here with the Bucks uh, sending out two salaries to match the one they'd be bringing back. So I'll credit uh, the great Frank Madden for this, but these are some names, and we were discussing it a little bit earlier. These are some names for the Bucks that uh, the salaries fit anywhere from $5 million through to around the $20 million range, which then the $20 million stuff, you, as you pointed to, if that's the path you go down, it's it's it'll be two guys. But But here's some names that, uh, Frank certainly referenced, and we've discussed them a little bit over the last uh, couple of weeks, months, whatever it may be. So Hunter and Bogdan Bogdanovich in Atlanta. Now, again, like some of these guys might not be attainable, but these are just some names here. Uh, Ricky Rubio, Alec Burks, again, a guy that the Bucks you know, reportedly, uh, reportedly uh, may have had some interest in 
in the past. Uh, Buddy Heald is there. TJ McConnell. TJ McConnell probably mostly just to avoid him uh, dropping 90 on you next season. Uh, Norman Powell, speaking of buck killers, he's at the around $18 million there. Luke Kennard. Am I on quickly? Um, who who uh, quickly is a guy that the Bucks were reportedly uh, interested in in trading for at the deadline. Now, he's at the $4 million range, and I think he went right up in the depth chart. Anyway, he played really good basketball, actually, after the trade deadline, which if you're a, a Bucks fan was probably not great. You would have preferred he was doing it for Milwaukee. Gary Harris is there. Uh, Kevin Herter, Malik Monk, who obviously had a great season in Sacramento. Uh, Gary Trent Jr., another guy we discussed. And then Colin Sexton, obviously a lot of people are talking about him there. So there are actually some pretty intriguing names and guys that you're like, yeah, I could see that the Bucs could use uh, those players there. So the point being, if, if and we say if, if the Bucs are out there making calls, there are certainly plenty of options there. And perhaps some guys that on teams, they might they might see some value in that. I'm not sure. Yeah, the Atlanta ones are um, the names for the Hawks are, are interesting because it's kind of an interesting spot or situation the Hawks are uh, are all of a sudden in as well. Where I know you brought in Quinn Snyder last year, you made the the play in and then playoffs, but um, they're kind of halfway towards well, let's make the best of this current group, and then the other half seems to be. This group isn't it, so let's try to retool on the fly. Um, Bogdanovich, look, if, if you could uh, go back, what, three years ago to that night <laughs> where we thought the Bucks had acquired Bogdanovich and then find out three years later he's coming back here, I think he would fit a lot of the things that we just addressed of a guy that has had some big moments and um, maybe not necessarily NBA playoff moments. He's had them, but certainly postseason in big stage moments, he's had them in international play as well. He can handle the ball. He can shoot. That would make a lot of sense. But again, it's a relatively high deal that he just re-upped. Uh, and he has that trade bonus too. It's close to $19 million, I believe. And he's extended through the 26th season, I believe. So this would go past the, the timeline with the rest of the veterans, which I'm not sure if what this team's stance is on that. If they want to be able to quickly pivot in two years and retool on the fly, I think the elephant in the room, the name that most Bucks fans have been trying to figure out, how do we get him here and going to the trade machine has been Colin Sexton. And I mean, sure, you can make that work in the uh, trade machine. I would love to have Colin Sexton as the guy that's running the uh, second unit offensively and even playing some combo guard with Drew Holiday. I think he would fit nicely with this team. I'm still not sure why Utah does that deal without even more assets coming back by way of draft assets. And the Bucks certainly don't have a lot to give in terms of young uh, talent, and they have even less to give in terms of the draft assets as well. But Utah kind of seems like, you know, last year we all thought they would tank and they were flirting with the play-in tournament. But, but this year it seems like maybe we'll see a little bit of a step backward and, and they're trying to offload some more of those salaries where they're kind of in a halfway spot as well i just don't know if the bucks have enough to uh, to land colin sexton so if they could get him great but i think in terms of trade you kind of have to set your sights a, a little bit lower and on some of those names that were closer to like the five million dollar range and again unfortunately i don't think that's a manual quickly either for the same reasons we said uh for colin sexton take out the big salary but in terms of what you'd be giving the knicks back I just don't know what the fit is there. Yeah, aim high at all times. That's always my suggestion, and that's certainly what people are doing. They might even be aiming higher than some of those guys. As I scroll through my Twitter feed there, so it's going to be fascinating, though. And uh, again, not that anyone needs us to point this out, but certainly as it currently stands with that rotation that I mentioned, whether it's Grayson Allen, Bobby Portis, Pat Connaughton, uh, those three guys stand to be incredibly important in the Bucks rotation as it, as, it, as it is right now. So... Uh, when we keep talking about the six or seven or eight guys uh, that you think are going to fit in that rotation, right now uh, they are guys that are that are firmly entrenched in that. And you mentioned Emmanuel quickly. I think I called him Aman quickly before. And look, I know <laughs> I know I'm Australian and we like to shorten everything, but it didn't feel right uh, when I said it. So um, yeah, nice. Can't be can't, well, be, can't I, be right I, at all times, Justin. I, yeah, I mean, I was going to say. Um... One name you didn't mention, and there's no reporting on this, and this is just pure fan fiction. Um, but, I mean, hey, the Bulls are certainly 
all of a sudden loaded now in the ah, back court, and especially at the point guard <laughs> position. So what's it going to take? Maybe we just swap jerseys between Caruso and one of his rivals with the Bucks. But what's it going to take for us to get to Alex Caruso to Milwaukee? I mean, that that would be for me the number one guy that I would covet. I again just don't see what the fit is in a trade. Interesting. Certainly a name that's been mentioned a lot as well over the last uh, probably six months when it comes to the Bulls and everyone tries to figure out what the heck Chicago are doing uh, with that roster uh, as it currently stands. So Caruso, another name there. But let us know in the YouTube comments. Also give us your uh, reaction to Malik Beasley and Robin Lopez reportedly set to sign free agent deals with the Bucks as well at the price tag uh, of a veteran's minimum, which we discussed yesterday is about all the Bucks have got to give at this point in time. But uh, the ro- roster is certainly taking shape. That doesn't mean that there won't be other changes as we've discussed today. Uh, but jump on YouTube in particular. Uh, get in the comments. It's a little bit challenging on Twitter right now to uh, interact. So uh, YouTube might be the place to do so. If you haven't gone and done that yet, uh, subscribe and follow the channel there. We have different polls and stuff that you can uh, interact with us there as well. So it's a whole lot of fun. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Certainly the plan right now is to talk about Summer League, but things could change drastically at any moment. So we'll keep uh, on our toes and see what the latest news is. But we will be back for more Locked On Bucks tomorrow. So until then, uh, take it easy. It's a holiday over there in the US. So uh, stay safe and we'll speak to you all then.